to find a text that will illustrate characteristics or features of the early modern period. So that's what I tried to do, see how it works. Two preliminary notes. First of all, I want to emphasize this text was found by Johann Petrovsky in 1993 in the Vernatsky Library Jewish Collection in Kiev. Uh, Yohanan is now a professor at Northwestern University. When I spent a semester in Kiev in 1995, he introduced me to the text. Since then, I'd say we've been trying to help each other understand it. He's going to be publishing a major article about it next year in the AJS Review. So uh, you can view this as a uh, uh, appetizer. <laughs> Secondly, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the background to the book uh, so that you can understand the context of what we're going to read. Uh, the book was written by Hillel Baal Shem, <clears throat> who uh, was probably born somewhere in central or eastern Poland in the late 17th century. Uh, he was active in the 1730s and 1740s, mainly in Volhynia, that is northern Ukraine today. Uh, he, but he traveled to many places. Uh, he was in Lithuania. He was in uh, Moldavia. He, was, uh, he might have been in Venice and Prague. But uh, his main activity was in Volhynia as a Balshem. Uh, in fact, we should look at text at the passage number four where he tells a little bit about himself. Other places in the book he also says things. Uh, passage 4, I, Hillel, lowly and disdain in the eyes of the outsiders, but not in the eyes of the insiders, which I don't come to this from the direction of Kabbalah, but since I'm not a scholar of Hasidism and I've touched on Hasidism, I thought I could also touch on this. Uh, I'm I inquired and excavated in sorrow, investigating until I found, after several years of wandering about the country, a tiny bit, a defective taste of the beginning of the holy writings of the rabbi, the great Gaon, the Hasid, the adept in all of the chambers of Torah, exoteric and esoteric, except that he himself told me that he never dealt in this business except for once, and he didn't succeed. His name is Svi Hirsch, son of the great rabbi called Avram, that is Avraham, the rabbi and yeshiva head of the community of Mezhezhets, or Mezerich, but Potlaski, not the famous Mezerich of the Magid, which is in Volhynia, close to Brestotovsk, Tikochin, and Vysoki Litevsky in Podlasia. I sat and stayed there, and from his waters, the words of the great rabbi, I thirstily drank a bit until I understood a minuscule amount, and this is probably a play on words with Zeran Pin, meaning also the smaller face of God. I copied from his holy books, and through his agency, with God's help, gradually I came upon a cure to be able to know how to fix the defects that I caused in the past, even when wandering in an alien land, until I merit bringing our suit a case of truth and justice. So you see from this that Hillel is a professional Baal Shem. He was itinerant. He made great uh, efforts to study with experts. Uh, one of whom was this Rabbi Svi Hirsch, whom we do know about as uh, the Rabbi of Mezerich at this period. His father also, you know, was the author of a book called Torah Chaim. His sons were also rabbis. And this is somewhat significant, as you we'll see. Uh, and he tells us elsewhere that he is desperately seeking money to marry off his daughters. I would sum up and say that uh, Hillel Baal Shem wanted what the Baal Shem Tov had, and that is to be the permanent recognized Baal Shem of a community, so that he wouldn't have to wander and eke out a living, but he would be stationed in one place, and people would come to him as they might come to the town doctor to take care of, his, of their problems. Uh, it seems from what he says here that he had some terrible failures as a Baal Shem. And we know from other Baal Shem that sometimes people died as a result of, or at least after, their ministrations. Perhaps that's what he's talking about. Uh, Petrovsky thinks that perhaps he was a crypto sabatian who repented. I'm not so sure about that. But uh, 
all through the book, he makes it clear that there's something haunting him from his past that he's trying to shed. And it seems that one of the reasons, or perhaps the reason he wrote the book, was to show that despite what happened in the past, he is a bona fide Baal Shem and really can do what he advertises. Uh, so he wrote this book, Sefer HaCheshek. Don't get too excited by the title. Uh, <laughs> It comes from Psalm 91, verse 14, Kivi that is God saying, because he, the person, uh, has desired me, or perhaps better been devoted to me, uh, I will deliver him. And that's what we're talking about here. That is uh, devotion to God. Now, this book is in the category of what we would call Sifre Sgula. That is a book that discusses the various practical Kabbalistic methods, uh, manipulations, etc. There is a PhD by Chagit Matras from 1997 Hebrew University that deals with printed Sifre Skula. Uh, this book is much more extensive than anything we've known until now. It's a 400-page manuscript, about 700 pages, 700 sides are filled with writing. Uh, a lot of repetition, of course. Just to give you an idea of the kinds of things he deals with, uh, this is basically an instruction manual for Baalei Shem that tells you uh, how to stop epidemics, treat a sick child, prevent epilepsy, dizziness, craziness, headache, night fear, how to treat fever, wounds, pollution, diarrhea, insomnia, bad smell from the mouth, expel evil forces from the house, protect a feeding or cure a barren woman, regulate menstruation and heart beating, prevent evil forces from harming a newly born child, uh, stop girl's hair from growing, protect an individual and his habitat from an evil eye, from thieves, fire, bandits, Lilith, etc., etc. But I want to add, uh, I would say something like 50% of the book deals with problems of fertility and birth. How to get pregnant, and how to have an easy birth and prevent stillbirth. Uh, when you read this, you feel that Hillel, and I assume the people he dealt with, were virtually obsessed with this question. Now, what is early modern about this book? Well, here, of course, they have to be arbitrary and single out some features that I heard you say this morning, the oilam, that uh, the public uh, associates with the early modern period, and I suppose we can argue about whether that's appropriate or not, but at least it's a place to start. So what is early modern about this book? Uh, first of all, building on a point that uh, Ronnie mentioned in his lecture last night, uh, I don't have a passage to illustrate it because I didn't know he was going to talk about it, but thank you. Uh, the question of appropriating the culture of the other. The examples you gave last night were Christians appropriating Jewish culture. Well, it works the other way as well, and you see it very clearly in this book. Now, of course, uh, Jews believed in demons long before the early modern period, as did virtually everyone else. But what we see in this uh, book is it's full of Slavic words, but not just words, technical terms, whole curses, imprecations, several lines long of Slavic, that is Polish or Ukrainian, transliterated into Hebrew letters. He uses the, the uh, name of Lucifer. He talks about Hades. Uh, sometimes he uses the Gregorian calendar. And the most uh, shocking thing of all, at least to me, uh, he gives instructions as to how to make a voodoo doll to harm your enemies. The whole bit, the wax doll, with the pins. Uh, so if we're talking about the uh, blurring of boundaries and the creation of new cultural spaces, I think this is a good example. OK, but the other things, if he's using Polish words in Polish terms, it's obviously Polish. Uh, no, I didn't mean to imply that voodoo is Polish. <laughs> All I meant to say is that the boundaries are spreading. <laughs> Okay, another 
early modern feature of this book is the uh, penetration of mysticism and magic into everyday life and becoming part of normative or normal experience. First of all, the text that we just read, we see that one of Hillel's teachers, uh, I suppose he would consider him the teacher, uh, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch, was uh, very familiar with uh, practical Kabbalistic um, techniques and texts. And of course, he's just one of many rabbis who are like that. We can give a long list, including Ibeshitz and Emden, of uh, normative rabbis who were also a Baalei Shem, or uh, at least uh, familiar with Kabbalah. Secondly, uh, Hillel names a large number of Baalei Shem. He names five by name, uh, people that uh, either he knew or knew of. And then there's the question of the communal role of Baalei Shem. If you look at the first passage, he gives us a flavor here of what Baalei Shem did. I, Hillel, lowly in disdain, gradually turned away from all mundane matters, and I thoroughly searched and investigated all of the methods until, with God's help, I found medicament for several medical conditions as well as many magical expedients that Ashbadai the king revealed to King Solomon of blessed memory. Now this goes back to a uh, passage in the Talmud, Masech uh, 68 A and B, where Ashbadai, uh, the king of the demons, reveals secrets to uh, King Solomon and gives him the Shamir, the special worm that cuts stone. In the Zohar, there's a version of this episode where Ashmetai gives Shlomo four books of secret knowledge, and evidently uh, he's basing it on some version of that tradition, although I don't know exactly what. And I function with God's help in several communities and in several locales as people saw and can give solemn testimony. So again, he's very uh, certain here to give his bona fides. All that they saw clearly with their eyes and heard with their ears, they testified to with God as their witness, all of it trustworthy. Thus be extremely careful that this holy book gets into the possession of only of one who is pure. He should do and behave according to the fit and proper custom, studying thoroughly how to come close and perform a given ritual. He should be precise in writing there, that is the amulets, cameo, consonants and vowels, as I have thoroughly explained. So you see here, Baal Shem, uh, ministers medicines, writes amulets, uh, performs certain ceremonies, all of which are aimed at protecting people, what uh, I like to call supernatural defense, protecting people from problems with their neighbors, with other people, protecting them from problems with nature, that is health, and protecting them from supernatural problems, uh, mainly demons. So that's what a Baal Shem does. And uh, this was something that was very common, as we see from this book, certainly, uh, in the society in which he lived. Uh, interestingly, of course, doctors also employed what we would term magical. At least I think we would. If you look at passage number six, if a person's debility, God save us, is innate, or due to food or drink, or a fall in his house or on the road, or the failure of organs on the inside or the outside of the body, then there is no call for holy names or other such expedients. One must utilize treatments from trained physicians who study and practice with great physicians from many, many books and are expert in chiromancy, in science, or in the science of physiognomy. Uh, so doctors uh, weren't exactly as scientific as we might think of them as being. So everybody is using magic. Everyone believes in it. Uh, and this book is full of how to use it. On the other hand, this book also shows what we saw implied uh, in the two texts we spoke about in the last session. In general, I would say the two texts from the last session are from the beginning of the period. I'm forgetting Emden, but uh, the Chayat and the uh, Chaim Vital are from the 16th century, written by people in the elite. And here we have a text from 
the 18th century. I, I don't think I mentioned that. The, the text is from about 1740. The last uh, things that mentioned that can be dated are from uh, uh, Taft Saditet, so that's uh, 17, or, uh, Taft Kuf, 1739 or 1740. And um, this is a ground-level ground view of what's going on with Kabbalah. And you see here as well ambivalence towards the use of practical Kabbalah. The fact that it was common, that it was considered normal, doesn't mean that everybody uh, was in favor of, a, of it or everyone employed it. Uh, so as we saw in text four, I'm sorry? This is practical Kabbalah. Yes, practical Kabbalah. It's a whole yes. Story. Yes. Although they believe that it's connected to contemplative Kabbalah, that it ultimately comes from there. Um, so, so as text, let me just finish the sentence. Text four, uh, if you recall, Svi Hirsch ben Abraham, the rabbi, although he was expert in this, he only used it once and not successfully. So he didn't practice. And we find this, uh, many other examples. Uh, Pinchas Katznellenboygen, who wrote a 300 page ethical will, which is really an autobiography. Uh, wrote about his grandfather, who said uh, you shouldn't have anything to do with the secrets of Kabbalah. And then his father, who said, well, you should know about it, but don't do anything with it. And then he, of course, who uh, himself consulted Vale Shem. Or uh, Emden, who said practical Kabbalah is a crock. But he did happen to have two magical rings that, upon occasion, he used when it was really important. So uh, there are different levels of belief in these things and use of these things, even by people who might theoretically believe in it, but still um, believe it. it's dangerous or uh, shouldn't be used or whatever. Um, and there's also the problem of fake Baalei Shem. If you look at passage number three, if some man appears and says that he is a Baal Shem, even though he shows some recommendations from famous, well-known people, even so he should not be believed until his actions are thoroughly investigated. Now, what are his qualifications? A, is he learned? So he shouldn't be a total Amaretz. Does he know the divine names? Where they or originate? How they function? Or perhaps what is their purpose? Does he act according to proper practice? So, does he know something? Does he know the Shemot? You should test him on that. And does he act in conformity with the prescribed rituals? If so, it is permitted to take amulets from him. Obviously, if a kosher person goes and acts according to proper practice, but, God forbid, it happens that he has slandered, God forbid, and I wonder whom that happened to, don't judge him guilty, or perhaps don't hurry up to pronounce your judgment, until you come to his place, hearing is not the same as seeing. The whole matter is an act of the demons who get angry at someone who is always working against, dealing with, getting involved with, and provoking them, the demons. Since they can't penetrate his immediate four cubits, he has the force with him, they damage his property and not his person. In other words, they damage his reputation, they damage his ability to make a living. I think he's talking about himself, but the point is that there are so many fake Baalei Shem running around, as Piekash has written about, uh, that it's hard for a legitimate person to uh, make a living, and we might add, especially when he makes mistakes and doesn't always produce results. Now again, Petrovsky thinks that these fake Baalei Shem uh, might be uh, Sabatians or crypto Sabatians. Again, I'm not so sure, but yes. Yes. Uh, can, I, can I ask for some clarification? Sure. <laughs> uh, I uh, wasn't buying fully into what you were saying. Uh, you mentioned that appropriating the culture of the other and penetration of mysticism and magic into everyday life, mm -hmm. and these are the characteristics of the early modern period. And I, in my, my sense of medieval Jewish culture, certainly leads me to think that both of those things were occurring uh, well, quite a bit earlier 
Um, you know, I, I, I'm comfortable with the idea that the early modern period is a period in which there's a professionalization of wonder woman, but I think that's quite different from saying there are not Ba'alim Ma'asim who, who are, who are you know, being, who show up in all kinds of medieval sources. Um, I also don't think that chiromancy and physiognomy should necessarily be perceived as magical. I mean, they may, I might not go to one of those practitioners for my own health, but I think that they were, they, you know, I mean, this question of how do you characterize a particular uh, approach to, to healing, you know, that's very, very tricky, but certainly we know that Ramban invoked Shadim, we know that Ramita Hasid was called the Baal Masim. I mean, there's a whole tradition of wonder working, it's just, it, it's not professional. Well, you can go even farther back in the Talmud, you know, that's certainly. Right, so that's, that's not the Bible. Well, here I really go uh, in the wake of Elizabeth Yates, where I, she sees, and I think correctly, that uh, in this period, there is a recrudescence of mysticism. Francis, 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 Francis. Who wrote about Elizabeth? <laughs> Elizabeth Yudhikov. Right. Uh, and we certainly see a tremendous growth in the number of Bali Shang in the 16th, 17th centuries. Well, that's a different matter. Right. I, think, I think, in other words, I think this has been a there are, there are reasons. You know, that, that could have to do with the breakdown of the Aristotelian world system, with the appeal of, of uh, alternative world systems, Platonic and otherwise, I mean, about which Francis Gates has written. But that doesn't mean that, I mean, you could talk about an increase, perhaps. Uh, I, I like the idea of talking about professionalization as, as making this into a, a market. Um, but, but I really, I'm not comfortable with. Uh, well, and what about popularization? The fact that it seems to be so much more easily resorted to in this period. Can I yes. ask a question about the voice in the text? It's a first person voice, and I'm wondering whether there's a sense that there's something early modern about the eye emerging. I know it's not unique, but is there more of it in this period? And, and well, I mean, this is, this, this is a period where we have the first fill out of biographies, if that's what you're talking well, about. Well, it is. I, what yeah. I'm saying is there's something about this text. It's not just prescriptions. It's, there's some, well, he's very concerned there, about himself and correct. proving that he is well, okay. Well, it's sort of confessional. Things yeah. didn't go well mm -hmm. for me. Things mm -hmm. can go well. So that seems to me something that might be... On the other hand, it certainly is not an autobiography in any way. I said it was. Uh, or even... Um, that's a, very, that's a minefield. <laughs> he does, by the way, uh, discuss uh, two exorcisms that he performed. Uh, that's part of his bag of tricks. So, yes, John. I, I, I wanted to, to add first that clearly, just, just as, a, as a reminder, not the only things that will be germane within this vaguely defined period of a few chronological centuries are the things that are unique to that, to that period. Things that are going on, that continue to go on, but that were characteristic of an earlier period and maybe of a later modern period are obviously very part of, of literature as well. Um, but also to ask along the lines of what might have been more uh, distinctive. The, the, what was found here was a was a manuscript. You said, "Is there? Do you have a sense that there was an intention to, to 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 publish this? I'll get that, to that. Therefore, it might have been part of his effort to uh, point after uh, next. Yeah. Okay. Yes. This is a partial support of your initial statements. Uh, it's a point. I don't think the fact that other people have raised examples of wonder working from other periods means that this is not a characteristic of this period. And he, he doesn't, I don't believe he said me. I think everybody else jumped on him as if he had said me. It could be characteristic. It could be prevalent in this period. And you know what? You could find it in a lot of other periods too, whether to the 
even if it were the same degree in all the other periods, you still could say it's characteristic of this one. But you might not say it's distinct, and you might not say it's unique. So you mustn't confuse all those things. Just because we find something somewhere else doesn't mean he can't say it's then, characteristic. But then it's not meaningful for periodization. No, we have to define periods only if we have a one time occurrence on the historical. Uh, but I'd let's just like to add uh, methodologically to what Lois is saying that uh, I'm not saying this is necessarily the case here, but it might be the case somewhere that professionalization of such a phenomenon is actually a sign of decline. That is, I can imagine a situation whereby some of these, what we might call dark sciences or, or whatever, uh, are widely held forms of popular knowledge. And then when and everybody knows how to give an evil eye when necessary and things of that sort, but that at a certain point uh, it becomes only the domain of professionals and you go to someone when you, you, you hire a hitman to give an evil eye rather than um, give one on your own. So I'm not necessarily arguing that that is indeed the case, but professionalization can be a sign of decline of a phenomenon rather than an increase. Well, that connects to the next point, which is, again, uh, taking Yates' hypothesis, which I realize is somewhat controversial, that mysticism and science are really two, or mysticism and magic, uh, and science are really two sides of the same coin. She argued that uh, both reflected a belief that uh, humans are in the center of concern, and that people have it within their own power to control their destiny. So some express that belief by resorting to magical techniques, and some express that belief by trying to discover the scientific secrets of the universe. And with Hillel, what was striking to me, based on comparison with Shif Chayabesht, which came out, uh, well not came out, but was compiled probably about 60 years later, in the early 1790s. Uh, and Chief Kabesh is clearly discomfort with uh, scientific medicine and doctors and uh, rational approaches to things. And the, the book is constantly trying to prove how the Baal Shem Tov bested doctors and people with a more rational approach uh, to what he was doing. Whereas in this book, there is tremendous effort to cooperate with doctors, to learn from doctors, to coordinate with doctors. And just to give you an example, if you look at passage number two, That the great doctor of blessed memory told me, the sage, the leader of all the Polish lands, who was a great expert and adept, named Yitzchak Isaac Fortis in Latin. Now, uh, Yitzchak Fortis is a very famous Polish Jew. Uh, he served some years as one of the, as the Parnas of the Vada Baratzot. He was a doctor for two of the most important uh, Polish families, Polish magnate families. And, uh, was his Hebrew name Hillel. Kazak? Yitzchak, no. No, no. No, no. Well, Fortis, Blachon, Latin. Well, and, so his Hebrew was no, what, Chazak or something? Yeah, Chazak. Yeah, yeah. uh -huh. So uh, Hillel mentions him at least a dozen times. Uh, obviously, he felt that the uh, aura of this important person could rub off on him. And now what he says here, in 1653, there was a great epidemic and plague in the city of Rome. Actually, it was in 1656. David Ruderman has written about it in his book, Jewish Thought and Scientific Discovery in Early Modern Europe, it's called Early Modern Period, whichever. Uh, so this was a, a plague that made an impression in the Jewish world. And uh, Hillel says that he learned from Fortis, those householders who swept their homes neatly and cleanly and who fumed and decorated with all sorts of beautiful appointments and fragrances and wore handsome clothes, all of them were saved. It is thus good to fume a house and its rooms with herbs and spices that leave a good odor. No magic, no incantations, no amulets, just basic hygiene. And 
<laughs> but, uh, but there is a Hebrew treatise on the on that place. But I can't hear. If your home is dirty, then there are demons. Yeah. Right. Hey, genius, the is that also okay. But but there's no magic involved here. It's not that you should. In addition to clean, or when you clean, you should say X Y Z in order to keep the demons away. Just clean. And, uh, and he also mentions other doctors. He mentions the famous uh, uh, Dr. Yaakov Tzahalom, who wrote a famous Oh, well, he's the one who wrote the treatise on, right. on Rome, yeah. And uh, Emmanuel de Yona is another 17th century, I think he died in 1702. Uh, supposedly he studied from, although that seems to be pushing it a little. I don't think he was old enough, but uh, I could be wrong. So. He's very concerned to show that not only did he study with great rabbis and experts in mysticism, but he also studied with doctors. And then, as we saw in the passage we read just before, he recognizes there are certain problems that you don't use shemot for. You go to the doctor. So he is interested in cooperating with the doctor. Now, uh, does this mean? Uh, so first of all, I think it does illustrate Yates's point that two things go together. Does it also mean that uh, we're in a period of decline? Well, perhaps. What's interesting, though, is how this spirit of cooperation, at least in Sheikh Hayabesht, two generations later, has now become very much a uh, situation of competition. Now, perhaps in his time also, there were people who thought they were competing with doctors. You just, uh, or at least I have not. Yeah, but John no, I'm sorry? Sheikh is not of the same genre we're talking about here. Right. And he's portraying the Besh not just as a, as a Balshim, but as something rather beyond that. So I'm not, sure. not so sure about that, but OK. I mean, okay. It, it, sh it shows several situations in which Either people don't believe in a Baal Shem because they're so rational, and he proves that uh, yeah. the Baal Shem does, can be efficacious, uh, or situations specifically where he comes up against a doctor, he uses his Baal Shem uh, techniques, and the doctor uses the doctor techniques, and he wins. Yes? Well, again, Sheikh Chavesh, it's clear that the best credits the magical powers of non-Jews. That he is afraid that a, a priest might be able to work some kind of this type of magic and uh, bring about a bad result. Uh, and conversely, non-Jews are willing to go to a Jewish Baal Shem to, to get help. Uh, and there are stories, uh, there's a collection on the high uplands uh, about Ukraine in the 18th century, and it has folk tales about uh, uh, Christians who go to Jewish leaders. This is, this is very bad. John Christ is going to go about that. <laughs> 
in the 19th century, so it, uh -huh. it persists, right? Right. It could be that the phenomenon is much, much more widespread at this point than so you're suggesting. Yes. I wonder, um, sort of trying to take into account all the various points of the about the way in which you're trying to use this to periodize, I wonder if the argument then has to be made that there was an ongoing uh, uh, and many layer use of various mechanisms, approaches, theories, I don't use the word, but, but all kinds of things are used by people in different ways. What you have here is an anthologist, a, a, uh, an omnivore fellow who's willing to take from everybody. Uh, in order to use him to periodize, perhaps what you would have to do is not so much worry about the categories of science or rationalism as opposed to uh, magic and irrationalism, because it's not clear that he would have know that difference. But what you have to look at is, first of all, the degree to which he reaches out. Uh, I suppose that's in a sense what you meant by uh, uh, borrowing from other cultures, adopting uh, other cultures, um, I think it's penetrating very right forth. But, but it's not a surprise that mysticism or magic exists in this world. But the question would be, could we actually quantify his omnivoricity on the one hand? And second of all, does he judge, and I think you were moving in this direction, does he judge some um, uh, styles or forms of meditation as more efficacious or less efficacious for the reasons that we can identify? Or is he a guy who just copies stuff down where he finds it, puts it all together? It sounds like he's a fellow because he's feeling bad about something that happened in the past, who is trying to establish credentials. Um, at the same time, he's pretty universal in what he's willing to include here. Um, and, and that is actually... Well, he insists that whatever he includes is proven. Right. Okay, well, but that is... He is trying to establish categories. categories. His categories are not categories that distinguish between magic and, and the rational. Uh, but he does have some sense that there are, uh, you know, like a doctor who might say, well, for this you should go to a neurologist, but for that go to a, a, a nephrologist or whatever. Well, but that, he has some sense of different specialization. Maybe that's what's early modern, though. Mm -hmm. That in itself, that kind of distinction within this enormous string that is not well, I down. I guess that's what I was trying to say when I talked about two sides of the same coin. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not sure you would have been aware that there are uh, points. The other person that I would bring into this conversation here is Thomas, is Keith Thomas, who mm. certainly would raise a lot of the issues that are relevant to them. The question I have about him specifically, though, is do you have any sense from him uh, of, a, of a critical apparatus or of a sense of being different? In other words, when we talk, let's say we take Newton and we realize that Newton was also playing around with alchemy and so forth, in addition to some little mathematical thing we did, I forget, some eat our way on the bus, it sounds something like that. Um, but he clearly had, he may have done both, but he clearly, in terms of knowledge, has moved mathematics to a totally new field. And he's aware of new studies. That is, there's a critical sense, a set of critical categories. He says that he's good, he's good, and you don't have to do this, you can do that. So he's willing to try anything, like a homeopathic doctor who says, yes, we can try this, we can try that. But is there any sense of criticism where he's excluding things? Where he's saying, no, but now we know something new. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you in a moment what he criticizes, what bothers him, but it's not that. <laughs> yes, folks? Uh, well, it seems to me that if we look at content, so we really those things, you know, that's not... The difference here is not in content, because I think most of the things, I mean, so the manuscript would, would, would be able to find in, in earlier uh, literature. What seems to me to rule, so it's not the knowledge, it seems to me it's more related to what is new here, and I can think about uh, as a, you know, an other example that shows that this is really early modern period is uh, Chaim Vital's Book of uh, Secrets. It seems to me to be very familiar, it, 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 it's also a collection of those uh, types of uh, recipes, uh, etc. This is what, 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 what is new here, and it's related both to what Michelle and Katya have suggested, is the new formation of knowledge. 
because in, in the Wikipedia manuscripts, usually you will find that either in a different genre or in manuscripts between different texts you have a genre of the mid and show all those very similar, but there, there's, there's not this connection of a genre, of a book written by an art profession more or less. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what, what, what exactly is the profession here, but it, it seems to me that this is what relates, not the concept of the knowledge, but the information of the knowledge, which seems to me to be the very modern. Okay, well that really brings us to the next point. Did you want to? Well, I mean, I don't want to pull you up. Go ahead, go ahead. That's what we're here for. <laughs> so what strikes me about your manuscript is how late it was, uh, yeah. as it's from the 18th century. When, um, let's say, Kavala was second, Kavala was a mini-crime. And when a manuscript like this was actually found in the 17th century in the English Civil War, in the Obama studies, I can't remember the name of the position, I think, I think Mr. Hatsby or something similar. In which, again, they're discussing amulets, um, using astrological theories, as well as using medical scientific methods. But what is the, the, the point of Obama makes, and which in some way echoes uh, Thomas's point, is that by the second half of the 17th century, so that was really sort of going out of fashion. And what strikes me about. The Jews are always behind. <laughs> no, the Ukraine. <laughs> okay, the Ukraine. So the Ukraine, But it's, not, it's really quite fascinating that what his references to, to news from Rome. So I was wondering whether it was in Catholic Ukraine or whether it was from Eastern Orthodox Ukraine. So there is a question then, in that, if you will, more backward uh, economic zone, but kind of frontier area, the Jews became uh, mobilized as a cultural knowledge from importing it from the West. So that, I mean, there is a kind of. It's early one in the sense that we're early one in the semi century, and the rest of Europe is the 18th century. Well, first of all, if we talk about doctors, for example, it's hot for this. So they studied in Italy, real doctors, and there were several famous ones uh, in, Pol in Pol Poland, so many Jewish doctors who studied in, uh, in Padua or other places, and then uh, later on, even in Germany. So, uh, that was one important conduit of Western knowledge, which he illustrates very nicely here, that he heard it from the doctor who was in Italy himself. So, um, the, the other point I just want to raise is what is very modern about this period is that when you read the 18th century, the 19th century Gentiles, um, there's no to do this. You don't have that, at least, it seems to me, in the 17th, 18th century. And what has transpired was in Christian religion. And there was no confusion of targets for Christian authority, which is a question that I have raised, but I do not have an answer to. And I think it needs to be raised as a larger question of everyone who wrote why in that particular anti campaign against magic, against witchcraft, Jews were not confused. In that campaign, whereas they might have been confused in the Middle Ages. So that seems to me to be one of the essential defining characteristics of the manifestation of magical cures in the early modern period. When Jews are somehow example, that phrase. Well, I have a, a different question, and that is why is it there's no uh, movement among Jews to uh, uh, chase witches, to hunt witches, to execute witches in this period? I found if that's a couple, three references to witches among the Jews, Jewish witches, but there's no uh, comparable witch hunt movement among the Jews, and I'm trying to figure out why that is so. Well, but anyway, getting back to our book. The next point that I, in my arrogance, consider to be early modern is uh, his relationship to printed books. What really bothers this man more than anything else uh, are the little handbooks of practical mysticism that are being printed mainly in Zolkiev in this period. In the uh, first quarter of the 18th century, at least six that we know of, uh, pocket books, literally pocket books, small format books, uh, were published in Zolkiev with these same kinds of cures and amulet inscriptions, etc. And this drives him up the wall. If you look at text number five, and this recurs in the book numerous, numerous times, this is the fate of Achitophel, who in ancient times committed a horrible act. 
So they found in the holy book called Sefer HaCheshek that was carefully hidden. Seventy-two elders fasted and prayed great prayers, searched and found it in the eastern wall. Now, I don't know the source of this business. Singling out the word kotel, that is kotel. Now, this is a little bit interpretation on my yeah, part. Good uh, but I see Boaz is shaking his head no. <laughs> and dealing with them, that is the demons and their names, and they succeeded. Then this book went from generation to generation. Today, however, God save us, they have begun tearing from the very roots. They have begun printing in Jolkia some fragmentary books in their own name. One is Sefer Tolot Adam, the other is Mifalot Elohim, Zevach Pesach Poel Gvurot, and there were others. Everything was plucked straight out of the aforementioned holy book that is Sefer HaCheshek, the original Sefer HaCheshek. And people bought these books so that they came into the hands of riffraff, archiparchi, who don't know or understand any book of wisdom. Only whatever is in these little books. In other words, the cookbook approach to practical Kabbalah. They don't know how things occur, and they don't even perform a proper practice as it is prescribed. Obviously, they don't know the origins or functions of the names, for they do not have the slightest knowledge even of the exoteric part of the Holy Torah. For all names are derived from Torah verses, either the initial letters, concluding letters, or middle letters of the words, or through other word manipulations, such as atbash, that is, substituting uh, the first and last letters of the alphabet, or the first and middle letters, which is Albam, and permutations and numerical value. All of these manipulations are so that the demons will not understand. There are many types of evil demons, destroying beings, earth and water spirits, Jewish demons and Gentile demons. Jewish demons also understand the Torah and the liturgy, which is why you have to use the numerology and the Atbash and the Albam to confuse them. Okay, now, as I said many times in Sefer HaCheshek, he criticizes these little handbooks, these little Sifres Vula that were being published and uh, distributed. Uh, are they available? Are they available? Yes, some of them are available, certainly, in Sifre <laughs> uh, you, I, I mentioned You were the director, you said. Okay. Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> As I mentioned, Chagit Matras has written a doctorate about these books. So uh, they are available, and so is the analysis. I have a suggestion about the Kotel. Yes. Unless, pause it. Okay. My suggestion is that it's an allusion to the Talmudic phrase, Katle de Chazire, meaning pork, uh -huh. which is spelled that way. So I know this is referring to something Cutlets. impure. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. Something impure. There's something impure. I think, it, what is it? Is that during the war you're allowed to eat Katle de Chazire? Well, I uh, just thought, since kuftaf, he is, kuftaf, he's not right? very kuftaf learned. Lamed, again, kuftaf lamed yud. Since he's not very learned, he makes a tremendous number of mistakes in Hebrew. Yeah, says he knows what it is. It could be that he just misspelled Kotel. But yes, Ken, what's the answer? <laughs> I don't think so. No, no, no. This is clear, it's clearly a pejorative. It's a pejorative part. You know, they call it the coattail, but it's really, you know, it's like what, well, anyway, what Leibowitz said about the coattail. Getting back to the book business. Uh, so what I think we see here is a rear guard action against printing books. In other words, also from the early modern period, what has happened is the printed book has taken over the democratization of knowledge, uh, you know, everything that you've all learned about the coming of the book and all that business. Here is a man in the 18th century who still is trying to control the esoteric knowledge. He says this should not be popularized, this should only be in the hands of an expert. Now, of course, there's something ironic here, because the question is, so why do you write a book? It is a manuscript, not printed, and he never intended to print it. Uh, all I can think of is that he showed it to people. In other words, he said, I want you to hire me as the local Baal Shem. You see this manuscript? This is what I know. And he didn't expect anybody to actually read it. Now, uh, except to pass it on, as holy writings were passed on, as, as he copied the writings of Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch, as according to the stories in Shifcha Besh, the Besh uh, took the writings of Rabbi Adam. Uh, so one way an adept is trained 
is to be initiated into the holy writings which are given to him. And uh, as Petrovsky has pointed out, the manuscript certainly is well thumbed and well read, but of course it's been in existence for a few hundred years, so we don't know exactly who and when uh, it was being read. But uh, it seems to me this is a last gasp attempt to uh, fight against the printed book. Uh, it is also true that uh, early Hasidim, Hasidism, we still have ambivalence about the printed book, and uh, many writings are kept in manuscript intentionally. And even uh, certain liturgical writings are copied by hand rather than being printed. So I think that's also uh, the last vapors of this kind of thing, which by the early 19th century completely disappears. Right? I wonder whether this uh, it's too late for this reluctance to print. And I would have a question to Western colleagues working on Western Europe, whether, whether at that time we have documents similar, uh, similarly reluctant to printing. Because if we don't, then this is, I do not see it as a clear evidence of Polish Catholic influence, which as late as the mid 18th century, you can still see the reference to the printed book mm -hmm. and controlling of the of the material. So, because there was no Yankee approach. But it's uh, much later than I, so still the majority of the Yankee covers wasn't printed. Okay. Uh, okay, I have a, this is on the table. Okay. All right, so let's, no, 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 this is just, just I want to put this into so what I regard as a very, a, a very grand context. If we want to look for a very recent expression of, hey, how come we're doing this learning from books? All we have to do is look at Connors and Vicious. Yes. What I'm suggesting, and I'll just get, throw out a couple of other um, episodes, I think that there is a, a, a dynamic that occurs in many cultures. I, I haven't studied enough to tell you if it's in all cultures, and, but in, in a culture where certain kind of knowledge is supposed to be transmitted orally. Um, and then, uh, as we know from, uh, I'm going to not get the Sudya correct, but the, the, in the, in the Gemara, when we learn about two Tanaim who are reading a book of Adada and Shabbat, and you're not, even though you're not supposed to write down Adada, okay, there, there are the, the, um, the, the explanation or the justification that's involved is uh, uh, because our memories, alas, are so frail, I, mean, I, I put that into the two brackets, but we have to make concessions, and so even or even knowledge which is supposed to be transmitted orally has to sometimes make it into an inscribed form. Can we find the same kind of uh, uh, comments being made by Rashi on the Talmudic passages pertaining to Megillat Starim? What is Megillat Starim? Megillat Starim is precisely the status of oral teachings that are not supposed to be have their authority in here in their written form, in their artifactual form. So you get these, you know, people violate this and, and people scream like murder about it. When when I would suggest, and now I'm getting into more murky territory than I'm trying to anyway, certainly the Hasidei Ashkenazi you know, screams bloody murder about the fact that people are now signing their works and they're claiming authorship, and then they, then Rabbi Yudah Hasid or whomever says, Zen Sefer Hasidi, because you can only capitulate to this coin. This is now the coin of the realm. Every time something gets inscribed, you really can hardly fight against it until you burst out and find a new arena which you can continue to transmit orally, which is kind of I'm, I'm rehashing the whole theory, and I'm not sure if I use it fully. I think Rambam and the codification is the same thing. People may scream about codes, but they have to add their Rambam because once the codes are out there, who else is, how else are you going to be, be recognized? So I think that this is, uh, I think that, that uh, Hasidut, I mean, in other words, it's the need for whatever one calls to rush about how loosely conceived, or as an oral teachings, teachings that are not that are supposed to be learned 
in a, in a face-to-face encounter with a master who's the embodiment of the tradition, not we can self and we can serve. That you know, this is yet another another manifestation of this at a time when the Sufre coming out or the Sufre school will be written and the guy's monuments being taken away from him. So it's not that it's you know it's never going to be the last one. As, as my sense is that this just keeps going on. Well, and until somebody okay. says, but uh, uh, I'm going to change the writing. But they're two, they're two different things. In other words, you were talking about a phenomenon. Uh, we can see the example of the Steins Alf Talmud. Steins Alf Talmud was put in Khairam by certain elements for the reason I think that you're saying, that it, it made what was supposed to be uh, an elitist text except too accessible. You don't need a teacher anymore. And that's a phenomenon that keeps repeating itself. And certainly this is an example of that. But it's also, it also relates to something more specific, and that is the printed book as the vehicle for violating the monopoly of the oral tradition. So the fact that there's always, there are always groups that want to keep the oral tradition as a monopoly to themselves, it's, it's true, but the question is, what is the competing medium? Well, that's so here, the competing medium is this kind of book, which I think was growing in importance and popularity throughout the, the, the period. So the larger phenomenon you're talking about certainly always exists, but I'm talking about this specific instance of it. But he wrote it because he can't live in China. That's well, he wasn't going to join them. He would never print this book. Right. He was trying to say, only somebody who can write a book like this and master it can be a Baal Shem. And anybody who just reads one of these cookbooks uh, is ridiculous. Well, I think we're going to call it a day for this lecture. Thank you very much indeed for watching.